As you may already know, ElderWorks is a not-for-profit organization supporting any older adult or senior who has aging questions, needs referrals for assisted living, memory care, home care agencies, or other senior housing options. Our complimentary services are always available to you. Just give us a call at 855-462-0100 or visit our website, elderworks.org, E-L-D-E-R-W-E-R-K-S.org, where you'll find hundreds and hundreds of articles and supportive material to help you through the aging process. Again, thank you for taking aging seriously and planning for your future needs. Enjoy ElderWorks Expo. All right, everybody, we're getting started. I'm Jennifer Crowell. I'm the founder and president of ElderWorks Educational Services. Thank you so much for showing up today. Topic dear, dear to my heart, my family has lots of dementia and memory loss, and I am not a patient human, so this is a very important topic for me. Um, I want to welcome Barbara Rosenberg from Elderwood. She's one of our advisors. She's been entrenched in senior living for 30 years-ish. 30 years? She's going to talk about herself in a minute. She's awesome. She's an advisor. She knows everything about Elderwood. She has a question. You can see Barbara. And then we have, I'm going to agree this, Olivia Matanga. She has the best name ever versus Jennifer Pitt. Um, <laughs> Olivia is the Vice President of Programs at the Alzheimer's Association Illinois Chapter of Chicago, right? Um, they're both fabulous. I appreciate you wanting to come here today and learn. It is super important and that's why we hold these expos. Do you have any questions? Please see I have one of these lovely people later. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. regarding senior living, home care benefits, and all support services. We educate nurses, social workers, nursing home administrators, physical therapists, occupational therapists, where needed, uh, statewide, we are uh, licensed to do so, and uh, we uh, have, have amassed thousands of people attending our CEs, continuing education, uh, which has become a virtual platform since the pandemic. So we are getting many, many professionals coming to us um, and so it's been, while we educate, we also help place. We're funded by those placements in senior living, in, in market rate senior living. Um, and the guidance we provide um, will help seniors stay home well or transition successfully into a senior living community. Um, very, very, very happy to be here today. And as we go, our slides, um, well, Olivia's gonna go ahead and start up her, her slide, but uh, take notes um, because there's not a, not a ton of detail on their bullet points, but. We'll get into some detail later, uh, maybe for each of us, but uh, Olivia, um, go ahead. Okay, so 
We'll start by going over who the Alzheimer's Association is. Um, well, let me take you back in time a little bit. We were established in 1980 by Jerry Stone. Um, he watched his wife battle Alzheimer's disease, and this really gave him the drive and determination to want to establish an organization where folks are able to go to for information, resources, and most importantly, support. Today, the Alzheimer's Association is the largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research. Um, in fact, currently, we are investing $300 million in 920 projects across the globe. So that's really exciting and that's extensive. Um, we have 70 chapters nationwide. Our home office is located in Chicago, downtown, in Michigan and Wacker, and then our Illinois chapter office is in Rosemont. <laughs> so we serve everyone. Everyone that needs our information, resources, support, we serve them. Caregivers, people living with dementia, healthcare professionals, the general public, everyone. <coughs> and so just some facts about Alzheimer's disease that I thought would be you know, nice to share. Um, Alzheimer's is truly an expensive disease, so much so that it can bankrupt Medicare and Medicaid. Um, there are over 11 million Americans that provide unpaid care for people living with Alzheimer's or other dimensions. You know, just to put this into perspective for you, that's 16 billion hours of care that these caregivers are providing to people living with the disease. And that's valued at $271 billion. Super expensive disease. Alzheimer's is the most feared disease in America. I remember when I was um, actually interviewing for this position and I had the opportunity to watch uh, our executive director do an interview and she made this comment that Alzheimer's is the most feared disease in America and I found that so jarring. Uh, but it absolutely makes sense to me because you lose who you are and no one loves that. Um, and then finally, Alzheimer's affects over 6 million people. That number is only going to continue to go up. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Um, so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with definitions. Um, please raise your hand in the room if you feel you know the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. Only, okay, all right, kind of, okay, great. So let's go through the, de the definitions. Um, dementia is a general term for loss of memory, language, problem solving, and other thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. Dementia is not a single disease. It's an overall term like heart disease that covers a wide range of specific medical conditions, including Alzheimer's disease. Disorders grouped under the general term dementia are caused by abnormal brain changes. These changes trigger a decline in thinking skills, also known as cognitive abilities, severe enough to impair daily life. So Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80% of cases. Vascular dementia, which occurs because of microscopic bleeding um, and blood vessel blockage, is the second most common cause of dementia. Those who experience brain changes of multiple types of dementia simultaneously have mixed dementia. There are many other conditions that cause symptoms of dementia, including uh, that are reversible, pardon me, including thyroid problems and vitamin deficiencies. You might have heard of senile dementia, which is what many people from years back formerly referred to dementia, because there was a commonly accepted belief that any serious mental decline is normal part of aging. Science now knows there are multiple causes of dementia. Often dementia will start out slowly and gradually get worse. If you know anybody that's experiencing symptoms, please make sure that you get them to see a doctor so they can have an evaluation and also get information and support. Okay, 10 warning signs. These are the 10 warning signs of 
dementia, you know, there are many different symptoms. They include problems with short-term memory. You know, it's things like keeping track of a purse or a wallet, paying your bills, planning, preparing meals, remembering appointments, getting lost in a familiar neighborhood. These are all warning signs. And if you begin to experience these, or you know, somebody that's experiencing these, please make sure they see a doctor. Um, coincidentally, 10 warning signs is one of our more uh, popular education programs that we provide. If you're ever interested in learning a little bit more, you know, see me afterwards. I'll share some information with people. We do have education programs that go a little bit more deeply into the 10 warning signs. And then this slide just kind of illustrates, you know, what I've been sharing. Memory loss, changes in mood, solving problems, confusion with time and place, speaking problems. So who is impacted by Alzheimer's? Everyone. Women especially, um, 60 uh, uh, sorry, women are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease and 66% of caregivers currently are women. People living, people that are 65 and, old, and older tend to be impacted more. The incidence increases with age. Hispanics and Latinos, African Americans, and caregivers, especially those who are working. And so now I turn it over to Barb. Thank you very much. Um, as a senior advisor, uh, and a daughter of um, somebody who went through 12 years of the journey um, from mild cognitive impairment uh, all the way to end of life at 60 pounds. Uh, a sister-in-law in her 50s uh, with vascular dementia, uh, who sadly we lost. Uh, we've seen a lot. Um, and the impact that I, I want to make is that um, if you're very young in those young years, or if you are in your 80s or your 90s, uh, this manifests itself in so many different ways. And just curious, in the room, how many have a very close relative or an immediate situation that you have been dealing with or dealt with? Okay, show of hands. Um, everyone has a, has, a, has a story. We got a call from the police that um, my mother had hit a car, drove away, and didn't really know that she had a car. So that was a visit to the front door. Uh, and that's how it started. And, um, and, and that was at 82 years old, and her life ended at 96 years old. But I have to say, for my mother, who went to Radcliffe College, class 48, um, was a child prodigy, my mother was smart. And my mother, in her 50s, she was born in 1927, purchased long-term care insurance. My mother paid the premiums, my mother planned with the best people, and so we have a very good story to tell about her life. My sister-in-law also has a good story to tell because she got this so young with an only son and loving family around her and out of state from us, but her son got in touch with the right people to plan for Medicaid. And there will be a Medicaid presentation after this at 2.30 to learn about planning for Medicaid because of what the cost of this is. And so there was a look back on spending. There was a five year uh, uh, you know, time period in which they worked out you know, her finances in order to have her go into a nursing home, skilled nursing uh, community, uh, for her care as they couldn't keep uh, my sister-in-law home any longer. And so I like to bring out two really good examples of, of, of planning. Um, and uh, before I start, and so, you know, so again, in the room, um, what of the people that you know that had dementia, you know, did anyone have long-term care insurance? Just raise your hand. They had long-term care insurance. And that insurance was used early on or middle on, a little bit of both, okay. And um, did anyone need to go into a skilled nursing community on a Medicaid? Okay, wow, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. 
as advisors, again, those are two personal stories. As advisors, again, we're getting calls all week from family members and loved ones and professionals, either a hospital discharge and they should not go home because of memory impairment. Or, you know, a spouse and living with the other spouse and the healthier spouse is aging because of that person's dementia and what is happening in the house. To an adult child who has to work and doesn't know what they're going to do and how are we going to manage this and where can we go. There's so many layers of people that are contacting ElderWorks for resources. And so we have sort of amassed a lot of resources and you can see a lot of that in that gym today if you walk through and met with a lot of the people that are there. Um, and so I'm happy that this talk is in the later part of the day because you got a chance perhaps to walk through and listen to some of the resources and maybe share some of your concerns. So, um, um, so you know, I, I just wanted a little prelude to, to that, um, you know, before you know, the first slide um, to, you know, kind of talk about the basics and some personal experiences and things that we that we deal with. So, um, so what are my first steps if I think my loved one has memory loss? You know, what do you do? You, it's not just, you know, oh, I lost the keys, or oh, I, you know, whatever, or oh, you know, you know, I, I, you know it's, I lost my laundry, or someone stole my pillows, or I made the bed and, you know, but now my earrings are gone. You know, you know, you start to you hear things, and if that sounds familiar to any of you, these are the kinds of things that, you know, can start to happen. So, the first thing is, um, we send people to the doctor. We send people to an internist to make sure there's no urinary tract infection. Urinary tract infections are very common in men and, and women, happens in both, primarily women. And I'm not gonna really get into the medical, but I did need to mention UTIs because that's a real common thing in the home or in a community. If someone's living in independent living or assisted living, they might start to need memory care. But the primary care can recommend a neuropsych evaluation, a neuropsychologist. A neuropsychologist can do a mini mental exam. A neuropsychologist can do um, more of a comprehensive three, four hour piece. And a lot of people with the mild cognitive impairment, MCI, tend to have that longer eval with a neuropsych. What does it tell you? It tells you what might happen. It tells you where you're at in the process. So it's just information. It also tells you whether or not you want to start on some medication. You know, the Aricept, the Namengas of the world, some of this early onset medication has helped some. They nip it in the bud for others, you know, not so much. But the, the, the internal medicine piece, the neuropsych piece, very, very important. Um, in addition, some families are proactive and they say, I want to go tour of every care place. I'm just going to go. I know she's got it. I'm just going to go. The staff is going to do an interview of the family, of the client, and they're going to sit with them and go through their, you know, uh, form for, uh, you know, it's never acceptance into the community. You never hear that language. It's always, you know, can we meet their needs? Can we meet their needs? Can our assistance living license admit, meet their needs? So some people just go there now. They say, well, you know, let's see what this place is all about. Maybe, maybe we're going to nip this in the bud now, and you know, that's where, you know, that's where uh, she should be. If, uh, in the second point, discuss their future. So, if somebody has mild cognitive impairment at the beginning of dementia, um, and I will, I will always mention the 24-hour rule. Cheryl Levin Folio, who has presented to us in the past because her husband in his 50s. Got Alzheimer's, and this is her whole journey. And this book is gorgeous. 24-hour rule. Um, uh, you know, you know. In that case, they uh, diagnosed him very early, but from a heart condition and a certain kind of heart condition that was that could have caused memory loss. But in the end, um, they um, ruled that out, and you know, he had Alzheimer's. And her book really, really tells a lot. So. They were able to plan, you know, what do you want? This is here, what are we gonna do after the shock and the sadness and how, how hard it is? They were able to talk together about, you know, 
you know, what do we want to do here? Do we want to stay in the home? Are you comfortable? Do you want to go live near your daughter? You know, choices. So, so if a person's got mild cognitive impairment, it's good for the family to meet if it's at all possible. Some people are more agitated and they don't, they're too scared to get the help. Um, and, you know, but again, you know, you can reach out to ElderWorks, we work with case managers, with all kinds of people to maybe help me with your family um, to go over there to discuss to di discuss the future. You know, asking what are you experiencing, what are you feeling, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, when you left the laundry room or you got lost in the car. Unfortunately, there are people that get lost in their car, municipality calls the family, but they continue to let that person drive the car. Yeah. The car is like a thing, yeah. but the car, Right? Isn't the car the biggest piece of independence that is taken when that happens? You know, and I don't know how it is now. Secretary of State could you know, do a letter, Doctor Cook, Secretary of State, have a license for them. But there are plenty of people that get lost that turn around and then kids say, "Yeah, it happened one time." You know, one time's you know enough. But so you know, are we gonna take the keys? You know, what are we gonna do? Um, we're gonna we're gonna arrange rides. We're gonna do this. So discussing, you know, discussing their wants. Um, you know, what's going to work in our home and what's not going to work in our home. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, the onset, you can't use um, a, a, a razor with a sharp edge. You got to switch it out to an electric razor. Um, sometimes stairs, gates, you know, things can happen, unfortunately, slowly, but they can happen also rapidly in the house. So there's a lot of home improvement things to think about. Um, and. Um, uh, life alert systems, um, be it a bracelet, be it a necklace, be it some sort of a movement. There are companies that make these kinds of things for the home. Um, you know, uh, you know, you do not want your family member who's in very good physical shape, perfect heart, always worked out, to wander out of your uh, your home. Unfortunately, we had that with my mother, who was super, super healthy, trainers, the whole thing. And, she could go out one door and come in another, and that was, you know, we needed to we needed to make move to a um, more secure uh, setting for her, uh, given the way her house was. But um, those are some things to think about, and um, uh, and then um, um, and then you know, always about you know, moving or seeking help, and you know, explaining you know what could be out there um, down the line. You know, should we go to um, um, an independent living place together, and then you have your spouse. If a person is alone, that doesn't always work out. Um, some people will move to a memory care and their spouse is in independent living. There are lots of layers of, of choices. Um, but um, um, also, you know, things happen where um, people, uh, you know, you know, there's, there's, there's medication balances, there's medication setting up the boxes, you know, people, you know, mismedicating themselves. So, you know, and also like the driving, the medication is kind of a thing too, taking that away, you know, setting up pills, this kind of thing. A lot of the agencies are not in medical home care. They can't touch the pills, they can point. Um, but if you leave somebody with a caregiver, um, that caregiver can only point. They can't put those medications in the person's hand to take. Um, that would have to be a, a nurse or a medical professional. Most the agencies that we refer are non medical home care. Um, and that's how it works. So the family sets up meds and then they can point, but just remember that, that they cannot dispense. Um, there's a lot of clinical research. Uh, and today you were out there, and I, I, I just took some of the resources that we have. You know, there's, there's clinical trials, there's Great Lakes, there's. Um, Autonomy antibody studies. Uh, there's a lot of different resources, and they may be in your bag. Um, and so, uh, people will go through clinical trials for early Alzheimer's, for more advanced Alzheimer's. People will um, decide that you know, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, while I'm helpful, and maybe I know I have the gene, which can be, you know, you can take a uh, swab of your saliva and know whether or not you have the gene. Um, some people will go into drug trials anyway if they know maybe they're going to get it or it's in their family um, and they like healthful people that have no symptoms at all. So there are people that are open to these various drug trials. Um, and so I want to uh, make a point of that because that's a family decision too. Do we want to do this? You know, is that 
something you would want to participate in. Um, and so I wanted to mention um, the, uh, the clinical research piece. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, caregiving. You've got, you know, the cost of caregiving, 25 to 35 an hour, 400 a day for women with licensed insured agencies, talking about who do, you, who do you want caring for you. And sometimes families take turns taking family leave with the Family Leave Act. It's a different generation, you know. We all work. A lot of you all worked. And then caring for parents, the old days of parents and aunts and uncles living in our homes. And caring for them, you know, I'm sure some of you remember that from your parents. It just not that way. It's rare. And so um, then it becomes who's going to take the family leave act, the FMLA? Who's going to do that? Or are we going to take turns doing that? Or am I going to retire? Like, how, you know, so these are all family discussions. And so, um, and that's part of, you know, you know, what do they want? And you can't really make promises because you can come up with a solution and you can come up with all this, but you know, if if the if the if if you know it's not in their greater good, then um, you know you need to you need to have those things written down the, the best that you can. Any questions so far? Yes. yes. Uh, where do you go for your test? Um, so ISO literature up here and information and Great Lakes, um, but um, you can I'll give you my card. You can you know you can call me. Um, you know, for any, any other resources, but uh, this may be in your information. Our, our friends at Ascension Illinois at Lexi Brothers Behavioral Health um, were at the booth today talking yeah. about the different trials. And then Great Lakes, um, not sure, but yeah, so Great Lakes is great, they're great, and so they're in your, they're in your resource directory. So thank you for asking that question. Um, Olivia touched on some of this. Um, is this normal aging versus dementia? Um, and I'm going to use from a slide um, of uh, Chris Petrick, who's our nurse and our educator at ElderWorks. Um, normal aging, the body slows down, but the intelligence is stable. So that's just to remember for normal aging, because dementia is not a part of aging. It's just not. And Olivia had mentioned that as well. Mild cognitive impairment, the MCI, issues with memory care functions and impairment, um, but you know they are, it's significant enough that it's interfering with daily life. That's the part of it. So there's the normal aging or natural aging, which is a really nice word, natural aging, um, and. But in natural aging, you know, your judgment, things like that, it, it just that's not that's not part of part of part of it. Um, I bring up the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now it's important I I would talk about it forever. I worked in the first one first retirement families ever built in Chicago, 5333 Sheridan Road, back in 1986. Um, you could test people. You could ask them a million questions. You could deny them on their walker. You could deny them if they couldn't press the elevator button. If they, if you noted any kind of memory, you could just deny them residence. The 1989 Americans with Disabilities Act changed all of that. And so um, this is not anything that is discriminatory. This is all about a license and a license for our community, what they can provide, where they feel the resident could be safest. Some people will say, well, you know, just if she has the meals and the housekeeping and a housekeeper comes, I can't get her to do that in my house. And her memory's not that great, but she, that's not really the right placement for independent living. Are you going to have a caregiver with her during the waking hours of the day? But does she go to sleep at night and then wake up sundowning, you know, or up all night and then wants to walk around at four o'clock in the morning? Um, you know, back in those days, we had residents and we did not see a lot of dementia back in the early to mid 80s. Or I guess it used to be called senility, as you all know from, you know, 50, 67, whatever it is. So, you know, we had a resident who every night they'd find her on the couch of somebody else's apartment. You know, she'd go hopping and fall asleep on someone's couch in her, in her negligence. I mean, it's just like, you know, and, and, and so, and we, I don't want to say we laughed, 
but it, you know, it wasn't funny, but it was different. It was different for those years. And so in, that, in those years, you had to go to a nursing home because memory care or assisted living didn't exist. These are new categories of living. So senior living, with the meals and the housekeeping and the staff at the front desk, was always, you know, that was it. And there were no other categories, but you had to go to a nursing home. Or you had to go home with your family member that would take care of you and make sure you didn't wander, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, I need to bring that up. Um, the, um, you know, I mentioned before um, the, uh, uh, the losing keys, the little things, those just aren't typical. Once people start saying, you know, repeated, 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 or, you know, they, they just, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, paranoid, um, stealing, this kind of stuff. So um, that's very important with distracted versus losing something. Um, I also want to mention that term when people say, well, they have, or he has, or she has, or they have, short-term memory loss. It's not short-term memory loss, really. It's the ability, or lack thereof, to retrieve and to store information. So then, you know, so you say, she's having trouble, or he's having trouble retrieving information. Or some of the stuff that's from last week, or two weeks before, you know, re you know retrieving that information, getting that information out, remembering it. Sometimes it's stuff from childhood, sometimes it's stuff from early marriage, that's all, you know, that's all stay sometimes, those parts of the brain, you know, it, 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 they're held together. Um, and so, um, you know, I bring that up because that's really important. Short-term memory loss is not really the right way to put it. It's ability to retrieve and the ability to store. How do I help my loved one with dementia if they cannot or will not accept help? So the first thing I want to say, and, and, and one of the most important things about the whole theme of this thing is, you are going to, God willing, do the right thing for your family member or your loved one, or you know, you know, help plan, or your children are going to do that with you. Um, but you got to, you got to put yourself first. You have to put yourself first. You have to make sure that you are getting me time, that you are breathing, that you are walking, that you are going home moving, that you are smelling the flowers, that you are drinking a Coke, that you're just enjoying a burger. Just, you have to stop and take care of yourself first. And I cannot stress that enough um, because the person with um, dementia is going to get the care. So, um, in terms of um, the different bullet points here, you know, communication techniques. You know, if you're not a patient person historically, you need to sort of figure that out because it's not their fault. The repeating, the repeating, the repeating, ask the same questions over and over again. The learning self-control, I understand. Sometimes less is more. Too much talking is just, you know, if you put an Oculus on and you saw reality of what a person with dementia is hearing, it's garbled and it's terrifying to hear it. You know, we had training and, you know, so um, communication. So just do the best you can, you know, without getting attending clinical, do the best you can to be patient. You don't always have to answer. And whatever they say to you that might not make sense, you just agree. Or you say, we'll do that tomorrow. Or you know, or if they question who you are, it's terribly upsetting for a 50-year marriage, a 40-year marriage, to or a mother and a child, or you know, to not know each other or not know who the person is. And they could say, hey, I'm here to fix your faucet. I, you know, you gotta. There's a little bit of acting involved, but it's it's good. It's good acting, and it and it makes you less agitated because you have to do that for yourself too. And as an advisor, we need to do that because usually phone calls, hi Barbara, you're not gonna believe what's happening right now. My, my mother's in Amber Kick Condell and you know, 
we don't know she fell and we've been watching like and a mile a minute and usually the first thing that i will say is can you breathe i need you to breathe right now i'm going to help you with thoughts but just please breathe so um communication is really important um written notes or post-its you know for the early stuff you know putting things up on the fridge putting things on the bathroom mirror um, maybe if you go to a restaurant, you have a card, and it says to the waiter, my spouse has some dementia, kindly be patient. There are people that make, they look like luggage tags. I credit uh, that, uh, again, with Cheryl Folio in her book. Um, and again, Elder Works is not funded for any of this. I just, I know her personally, she's a very good friend, and there's so many great tips in here. But she would do that with Michael. Um, um, you know, bring like a luggage tag type of thing and show it to a, the wait staff and show it to the management and they were very patient. So that nobody has to talk. Because respect, respect for the person with dementia comes before anything. Because they got ears and they hear. And you know, maybe they'll understand. But you know, it's just, you know, respect. So, you know, reminders, things like that, um, photos. Oftentimes you'll see um, in senior communities, you'll see outside a door, there's now there's a lot of um, iPads going, photographs. Um, there's a lot of uploaded, shared stuff to families back and forth. Technology in dementia has, has skyrocketed. It's skyrocketed in our training. It's skyrocketed with, you know, in-home kinds of things, those frames that you can upload family pictures and they can just constantly see them. It's like an activity. You sit, oh, you know, it's a birthday party, oh. So photographs and connecting that way on as clear a big a screen as you can, so wonderful. Uh, always have an old fashioned, you know, my mom my called it her grandma book, in your purse or in your purse, old fashioned snapshots. You know, it's just the little things. So those are some of the things that are good. Phone calls. Um, there's new devices Apple makes, a lot of other companies make. These uh, devices that you can have installed in their home um, or in your home and then on their TV, the caregiver can sort of press a button and you can literally be in their house and they're in yours. So they're seeing you in a whole room. Um, so it's not just a phone call, it's active and you're seeing people. So you can look on Amazon, you can look on Apple, you can look and Look at the various devices. There's some very interesting things out there. Um, but those touches are really important. Get others involved. I think that's probably the most important. You gotta ask for help. You gotta get a neighbor. You gotta get a friend. You gotta get elder works. You know, um, you know, you, you need to ask for help. People will help. People will help your church, your synagogue, your mosque, wherever you go, you know, you 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 need to ask for help, and, and people are quite extraordinary when it, when it comes to this. If it's a grocery shop, if it's you know a pickup, if it's a ride to an adult day program, um, you know get others involved. Um, and I mentioned adult day this time because that's a really nice solution for people for programming that are living home. Um, you know, adult day just is great. It's it's a bus pickup, it's a lunch, it's activity programming, it's a movie, it's uh, interactive type of work. Uh, and there's uh, adult day programs all over. We picked up the Elderworks directory. You can find resources for everything. It's all in there. Um, safety system we sort of talked about already. Um, this is really blinking on times. But um, safety system we've talked about various uh, lifelines, things like that. The other thing I want to mention about safety system at the home, we recommend that people put a lockbox, like a wheelchair lockbox, outside the house uh, on a handle or have a knocked box put onto the house the fire department can get into so that they're not breaking down your doors if they have to get in there, if there's a 911. Um, and you've got, to, or you could call a neighbor and say, okay, the combination is 4121, just run to the front door and you can get in the house. So someone trusted. Um, you know, this is all about trust. Everything is about trust. But so, you know, um, and knocked box is required on a lot of new construction, but it's a good thing to add as a fire department access to get into the house. Um, and, um, uh, I mentioned Lifeline, uh, there's all kinds of many products out there. People, you know, cameras, people do cameras, people do movement um, type of uh, uh, gadgetry, um, and there's a lot of really sophisticated, nice stuff out there, and um, people are doing that. They see, you know, the family member, especially with the MCI, the myocognitive, you know, noticing wandering around at night, noticing when that person's going to the restroom or, you know, what have you. So, 
um, that's really important. And then, you know, support groups. Support groups, uh, wherever you can go, Alzheimer's Association is probably uh, the greatest resource in the entire world for support groups. And then locally, um, there are, again, you know, your parishes, um, and if you're not a part of that, um, you know, there are support groups all in your community. Um, but uh, the Alzheimer's Association is uh, epic for uh, what that is all about. Um, uh, and also, you can use your police. Use your police, use your veterans' um, assistance if uh, the client was a veteran. But let the police know uh, what might be going on. You can call their non-emergency number. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, they're, you know, the 911s happen. As long as clients get really paranoid, they hit 911. Um, and you know, they come and they see a confused person, they bring them to the emergency room, and then the social worker's responsible for what's gonna happen. So they're, you know, looking for some ID and so just have that person be prepared. Always have some sort of an ID um, on that person. Uh, wherever you can slip it in, if it's a wallet, if it's, you know, pocket, you know, uh, always have that, always have some kind of ID. Um, who can help me care for my loved one? I love this. Sometimes asking for help is the greatest move you can make. You don't have to go it alone. Um, so we go through the gamut, and a lot of this is what ElderWorks does when we take in a client. Um, home care agencies, we only refer non-medical home care agencies that are licensed and insured bonded. Their caregivers are trained, their caregiver trained in memory, memory care specifically, and um, we don't refer private people. So someone said, oh, you know, do you have like a private care? Do you have a lady or a gentleman who might be able to take care of my mom or dad? That's not something we do because they're not vetted in the day of, of this of this world that we're living in. You want background checks done, and that's that's what's done. You want TV test or checks for x-ray within 30 days of appointment. You want to ask that agency, when you're interviewing them, can you tell me about your training process? Can you tell me about your vetting process? What do you do? Some do credit checks, some do you know very extensive background checks before they let anybody go into a home. And so $25 to $35 an hour for a caregiver, people's hair is raised, but you know, it is what it is. But that caregiver is not getting that money. That money goes toward insurance, that money goes toward they need a lot of cases to, to, to do well. So we have a lot of home care companies that are partners here that we prefer, and so home care. Uh, can be very trusted for uh, if it's a few hours and then family can kick in. If it's a living, there's a lot of um, a lot of different choices. If people can't afford home care, um, in the county you live in, Catholic Charities is generally the um, senior services for that county, and there are agencies that participate. Addis is one of them. They were here today. They have Medicaid, so they're on a Medicaid program um, for someone that may not have any means. Curious for the Alzheimer's Association for home care. Are there any portals for people that need home care that you know could be more complimentary, or do you, do you guys have any resources for that? We do. We have the community and the hobby. Please jump in. We have the community resource finder. Mm -hmm. It's on our website. You're able to go there and see what's local in your community. So if you're looking for that particular service, you'll be able to see that there. Right. Is there anything no, else? that's pretty much yeah. it. Because we have a non-endorsement policy, so we can't say, oh, X, Y, Z is better than ABC. Right. It's so it's just, like Lily said, you just plug in the zip code, it pulls all the services. Community Resource Portal. At ALZ.org. Community Resource Finder. So okay. ALZ.org. ALZ.org. Forward slash CRF. Okay, say that again. ALZ.org. ALZ.org. Forward slash CRF. Forward slash CRM is in CRF is in brain. CRF. Okay. So that's you know great resource because you know, it, it, you know home cares. I mentioned adult day programs. Adult day programs sometimes are thirty forty dollars a day. Uh, there's various adult day programs throughout the state of Illinois. Um, some have bus pickup, some don't, some you know, do lunch, there's different hours, different days of the week, so adult day is a really good thing to look at. Um, respite stays. Respite stays are short-term stays in a memory care or assisted living kind of community. Um, just to see if it'll work for the person, or the family's going out of town, and the caregivers you know, aren't going to be around, and 
you know, they just need to place their family members. A lot of paperwork involved, but sometimes license places will do a 30-day minimum. So you can do that. It's usually five, six thousand dollars for the month. Um, but um, some people will do a memory care, some people will go to a skilled nursing home and pay the daily, and they'll do that because maybe the person has complex medical and they need a nurse 24 hours um, if they've got um, any major medical issues. So um, respite stays um, are something to remember. Memory care communities, um, that is a newer category over the last you know, 10, 12 years. Um, there's different stages of memory care communities. Um, the early impairment and then it advances and so people can move to um, a community like that where there is a locked area, more secure, so they can't wander. But in the locked security area, it's, you know, you walk out to the gardens, you go in the hallway, you, there's a lot of places to go. So the whole culture has completely changed. These communities are beautiful. Um, unfortunately, they're very expensive. Um, they run, you know, memory care is sort of a six to ten thousand dollar a month piece. Um, and some people, unfortunately, can never afford to, to do that, and they need to go to a skilled nursing community. Um, and skilled nursing uh, community, um, which are the only type of community that take Medicaid, okay, for memory care or advancing memory care. Medicaid is a form of funding. Medicaid is not a bad thing. Medicaid is a great thing. Any of these places that you go to look, if the family member or loved one is on Medicaid, these places are only as good as the family. That's all over the director of nursing, the you know administrator of that particular facility. So it's really important that um, you have those relationships. Um, is if you're you know if you're paying if you're paying privately. So um, we at Elderworks. People will come to us and say, we have a catastrophic situation. My father's coming out of a need of health. You know, they placed him at this horrific skilled nursing community. I look, I see they've got dinks by the state. I try to help. We're not funded for AIDS, but we try to help find another place for that person who is on Medicaid that needs to be in a better skilled situation. Geriatric care managers, I bring that up because Again, they are private pay, but sometimes people need a care manager. They need a go-between the client, their children. Uh, they just need a go-between. They need that dynamic where there's hoarding, and they need to get in there and clean out all the credit cards and figure out if someone's being taken advantage of on the phone, on the computer, donations. Uh, has anyone experienced that? Anyone being taken advantage of? That's unfortunately a thing. A geriatric care manager can help tackle that if family members can't get to it. Uh, money managers, go ahead. No. Medicare has nothing to do with Medicaid. Medicare is your doctors and your hospital visits. Medicare is 100% that has nothing to do with living. Living is Medicaid. So there's planning for Medicaid at 2.30, there's not going to have a talk. But anyway, um, oh, it's all good. It's all good. And um, um, uh, so uh, Kathy uh, Casey uh, is actually talking 2.30 to 3.30 on legal asset uh, protection and um, Medicaid planning in room A. Um, she's an elder law attorney. I want to mention that. And also, if you know anyone that's a veteran that might need veterans benefits, Mikey Wanaki, um, who was also here today, uh, the Veterans Assistance Commission is also a place that you should look. Um, so that said, you know, this is all about plan now. Tell your kids to plan. You need to plan. You know, you know. Long-term care insurance is expensive. The old policy, so my mother had a lifetime policy. She bought it in her 50s. It paid for her life in a fabulous memory care place. We were very lucky. They sell these shorter policies that are four years, six year. They sell other policies that can convert from life insurance to, you know, uh, to care. So home care policies, 
are really important. There's also something called a home care policy. So if you don't qualify for long-term care insurance, there is a home care policy. You can ask a certified financial planner what a home care policy is. You gotta get it while you don't need it. You gotta be healthy to buy it. Um, your advanced directives. Written statement of a person's wishes. Medical treatment, including a living will, made to ensure those wishes are carried out to the person being unable to communicate. Do your powers of attorney for health care, your power of attorney for property, your will. You cannot get those online. Online is not personalized. Those are not valid. You need to go to an elder law attorney and have those drawn up. If they're old, have them drawn up. If you have long-term care insurance and that policy is old, go read it. Some of them never heard of memory care assisted living because they were written 25 years ago. And so they say, oh no, it's only gonna cover a nursing home. So it's real tricky, but know your policy. And the bottom line is pick someone super trusted. Pick someone you really trust for your power of attorney for healthcare property and for your second um, The POLST, P-O-L-S-T, is, a, is um, actually the physician's order of life sustaining treatment. And a doctor, it, ha it helps a doctor uh, that can, can sign off on this to give people with serious illness more control over their care by specifying the types of medical treatment they want during the illness, okay? And it should be reviewed periodically. This is not a thing that should be set in stone, yes? Where do you get them? The doctor. Or the doctor? That's all physician related. The host is the physician. Um, guardianship, you know, you know, we don't love it, but there are some people that just have no choice. There's no power of health healthcare, no power of trade property, the person is not managing themselves, and you got to take control of their life and make that decision. The guardianship is a whole legal piece. So, um, um, you know, again, I just, you know, wanted to uh, uh, to mention that. Um, also in the advanced directives, I want to mention there are people that want to keep their feeding tube. They want to keep their ventilator. They want to keep, you know, CPR, do CPR on me if I'm dying. There are people that make those choices. A lot of those kinds of things would not be accepted under an assisted living license in a memory care community or in assisted living. They would need to move to a nursing home. So if that person has that in their wishes, they cannot remain in that facility because those types of things cannot be done in private pay, assisted living, or memory care. It's an important thing to remember. Wow. We covered a lot. Yes, we did. We covered a lot. You know, what can you all do? Um, you know, the best way to support the Alzheimer's Association, other than, you know, donations and the walk, like, what, do, what do you want the public to do? We're always looking for volunteers. Um, you know, they are our tentacles, so to speak, in the community, um, taking what they learn about the Alzheimer's Association and the disease and sharing it with friends, neighbors, family, you know, so we were always looking for folks that want to volunteer and, you know, be an extension of who we are and make sure that the folks that need resources, information, support are getting that. And who better to trust than somebody that lives next door or somebody that you see at church? So, you know, if if this is something that you might be interested in, please let me know. We're always looking for volunteers. And the beauty of it, the Alzheimer's Association, yes, it's a you know Chicago-based situation, but they are everywhere. They are every county. They are doing their walks everywhere. There's just so much information out there with them, and so I want to stress that it's local. You don't have to go far away to help. Um, and um, do you use any phone banks to help call people that might have issues? Is that ever happen? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, Okay, no, I need to know if you're going to have any volunteers that do that or talk to families that way. Okay, okay. Uh, well, we're there for that and, you know, we can try to help connect. And um, I should talk about donations. I have to bring it up. Well, we're a 501c3 not-for-profit, um, and um, we are funded by our placements in senior living, but we're not funded by all this free advice that we give and so much our donations are so appreciated so thank you you know in advance for anything there our directory is free everything we do all of our online events um, so forth. so 
Um, and attend events, pick a walk, you can do personals. Absolutely. Um, our walk season is actually coming up very shortly here, and I think um, we have one in this is Lake County. Uh, we're in Cook right now. We're in Cook right now? Okay. Yeah. Well, we have several walks across the Chicagoland um, area, so please get involved. Please go to our website, sign up for a walk that makes sense, come out, support us. It's a really fun time. Um, you get to meet staff, you get to meet others, you get to make connections. Uh, please attend our walk. And even if you can't walk long distance, and it's not so long, but even if you go part of it, the festivities as you enter an Alzheimer's walk is exhilarating. It is exhilarating. It's the greatest. I've done walks for a million years. So, you know, come. It's just fabulous. Um, and on social media, we're Elder Works, E L B E R W E R K S dot org. Alzheimer's Association, you are ALZ .org. ALZ org. Take a look. Who's on Facebook in here? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, who's on, who goes to YouTube to watch things? Nice, because YouTube, this whole presentation will be uploaded to YouTube as of tomorrow. All the other classes are on YouTube now. Everything's been recorded today. So this whole conference is in perpetuity. You can watch it forever. So you can look up all the works and the whole, every class is online. You will see it all. Yeah. Do you have to be registered? Like, no. Can we tell our it's public. Public. So domain. YouTube, then what would you look for? Y-O-U-T-U-B, put an Elderworks Expo. E-L-D-E-R-W-E-R-K-S, every bit of this has been recorded. So all the classes, everything out here is all there in perpetuity. <laughs> so that's why social media is great, just great. Um, and um, when we say take care of yourself, just take care of yourself. Be good to yourself. There are solutions, there is help. There is hope. And um, I just you know, want to know if you have any questions or concerns. Um, you know, you can find either of us. Um, you know, um, you can leave us your information if you have any questions. You know, happy to talk to you. Um, but does anyone have any questions about any of the material today? Was it understandable? Yes. Oh, yes. It was understandable. See, that, that the language with this is really a lot. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, the Alzheimer's Association part of defining the umbrella of the dementia, do you feel less afraid of some of the language after this hour? Yes. So you, 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 you learn some other yeah. tools and training. Well, I, um, I would like to thank the Alzheimer's Association, Olivia Matango. Thank you for being my partner planning this. <laughs>